The question is, why were these fish overlooked, I assume, by fish and wildlife or by the fishing community? I would say the fishing community always utilized these animals um, for just recreation purposes, and I'm sure a lot of people ate them. There's records that go back that the First Nations people, of course, ate rockfish, and you can find that in the middens. I would say, though, that um, they are sharp, they are spiny, they're bony. There's not as much meat on them as I think most people would enjoy. And when you're eating salmon, like Pacific Northwest salmon, that's pretty good. Um, so that may be part of it. And it was just, you know, another thing too is this is, this is a great one. So rockfish come in all sorts of shapes and colors. Well, basic shape, but a lot of different colors. And you get a lot of browns and grays and these kind of off blues. And the really deep water fish are this bright red and they're really striking. Now, the reason why they're bright red is that as sunlight penetrates water, okay, if you think of like a rainbow, the color of, of white light, as white light penetrates water, red does not make it more than a few feet down. So any animal that lives very deep in the ocean is gonna be red in color because that's their camouflage. Red doesn't exist underwater, it shows up as black. So anything that's dark red, well that's great, you can't be seen at the water. So you bring those guys up to the surface, they're this beautiful red. Okay, so that's how the physics works there more or less. But if you're fishing, people are fishing a shallow water environment, they see all these kind of brown rockfish and they go, ew, gross, that's gonna taste like a mud sucker. And then they started catching these deep water rockfish when the technology got better. Oh, look at this one. And so if you're watching or walking down a fish market, right, and go back about 50 to 100 years here, and you see the catch of the day, and you see these brown, gross, blue, gray fish, ugh, pass. But then these bright red fish started showing up. Oh, this is a good one. Oh, this is a nice, healthy one. And so some of those things with technology and then people's perception over time, I think, factored in as well. And then once he's told us that we, couldn't, we lost half our salmon, then people lost it. They had to go fish for something. Um, so what do they eat from the beginning and then when they get older? So they're basically carnivores there? Absolutely. They are definitely a heavy predator in the environment. Uh, when they're first born, they're kind of planktonic. They're eating these little small uh, shrimps and things like that. When they move to the smaller, uh, sorry, when they move to the bottom habitat, they'll eat crabs. Um, I've seen them eat little brittle starfish, uh, copepods, really the small stuff. And then eventually they start eating other fish. They'll eat themselves, I mean their own species, they'll eat little shiner perch, herring is a big one, squid. Um, there's really, if it fits in the mouth, it goes in there. Um, I wish I had it with me today, but I have a video. Uh, this is good. When you all go home today, look at my website and uh, on YouTube and put rockfish eats sculpin. So sculpin, rockfish eats sculpin. I found a, uh, while I was scuba diving, I was filming, I found a brown rockfish, it's about this big. It was trying to eat a sculpin that was this big. And I caught it. It already had it in its mouth, and you could just see this tail, and he tried, and he tried, and he's trying to smash it against the rock and break it up, and it just didn't work, and I think my light was bugging him as well, so the rockfish just went, and out came this four-inch fish, out of this fish that was maybe, I don't know, how big is it, nine inches? Man, we always lie. Anyways, so it's amazing. If it can fit in their mouth, even if it doesn't fit, they'll try and eat it, so you name it. Wide variety. Go ahead. Ooh, that is an outstanding question. I don't have an answer for you on that one. Um, I'd have to check my books. I think it's just their own design. Not all of them live to be 205 years old. Um, again, the average age is 50, 80, um, 60. Those seem to be pretty good. Um, it may just be part of the cold water environment and the seasonality of it, where there's these kind of peaks of food and then abundance and it drops again. And also that ability to produce a lot of offspring and not take care of them. Um, animals that take care of their babies spend a lot of energy. Any of you guys have kids out there? <laughs> you know, I'm like, ah, you know, running around. So by just being able to just be like, instead of like one or two, I'm just gonna make uh, a couple hundred thousand. And by not putting that much energy into those babies, then it makes it easier for you or the, uh, the adults to go ahead and find food and survive. So maybe that's part of the strategy. Not really sure though, I'm kind of making it up as we go along here. It doesn't seem so, but what usually happens is that, you know, here we'll see a, a copper rockfish a, as a scuba diver in 40 to 60 feet of water, maybe even shallower, 20 feet of water. As I move down the coast to Southern California, instead of being in 60 or 40 feet, they'll be like 180, 200 feet. So they, it seems to be more of a temperature dependent thing, and so they will find colder water by going deeper. 
And the same thing about having El Nino years is that we get rockfish up here sometimes. We're like, what is this thing doing up here? It's not supposed to be up here at all. And there's blue sharks and molas and all that crazy stuff going on. So that's how they kind of handle that as you go to Southern California. But you'll see though that there's definitely delineations of the species over time. This one doesn't make it past Oregon. This one doesn't make it past Alaska, so on and so forth. So they stay where the environment suits them best. Yeah, sorry, in the back. Mm -hmm. With the moratorium, how, 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 first of all, how depleted are they? And, and with the moratorium, how long is it going to take for them to replenish to a, a reasonable level to sustain themselves? Yep. So in case you guys didn't hear that, the question is, there's a moratorium on fishing for rockfish right now. And a lot of people say, hey, I'm happy to go and abide by that moratorium. And I'm happy to wait because I want to continue fishing. I want to see these stocks rebound. But if you could just do me a favor, just let me know what time frame am I talking about here? And that's a really valid question. And the truth is, it's a complicated answer. I'll try and keep it somewhat concise. It depends a lot on species. The yellow eye rockfish, which is on our endangered uh, species list as a threatened animal, um, scientists right now estimate that it's going to take 90 years for that animal to recover. Keep in mind that animal lives a very long time, over 100 years. It takes it more than 20 years to become sexually mature. That's all built into a, a mathematical model, if you will. Something like the quillback, um, 100, uh, that animal can live to 100 years as well. So that's other a long one. Blacks, blues, 50 years. So those ones may re rebound a little bit quicker. So it's, it's such a challenging question because it's it's all species specific. Um, and I can tell you right now, it's, it's a very heated discussion in a lot of these events, not so much this event, but when even those scientists get together, because what are you trying to shoot for? Are you trying to shoot for the time in 1980 when we opened up this fishery? 1960? How far back do we want to go? And the thing is, we don't even have data to really say what number are we shooting for. So a lot of it seems to be based loosely on are the animals that we're seeing in the wild, are they old enough to reproduce? And how many of those do we have? And it doesn't mean that they're going to go out there and they're going to cut open animals and say, oh, this one's ready to go, and then put it back. You can kind of base this on size. And so what the scientists used to do is they used to just actually take one of those trawl nets and just drag it through the ocean, and they'd count those and make a mathematical model. Well, now they're using things like ROVs and going down there. They use special lasers so they can tell how big the fish is. It's all recorded on video. So now they're not decimating the populations just to find out those answers. So it is improving. I don't have an answer for you yet, though. So um, besides depth, is there any other way to avoid rockfish? At this time, not really. Um, you know, a lot of the communities that are out there, if you happen to fish, there's no secret to the hooks yet, but barbless hooks, different types of hooks that can be used are good. Staying shallower is good, but if you catch an, a rockfish that isn't the one that you wanted, or you say we're fishing for ling cod, and you catch a rockfish, the main thing is rapid resubmergence. And what that means is you brought it all the way up, you get it back down as fast as you can uh, without doing any harm to it. I didn't bring one with me today, but you guys all know the milk crates the plastic milk crates we see in there, okay? So what uh, a lot of people are doing is they're tying rebar or zip tying rebar to those milk crates. They come up with that rockfish and they go, oops, they already have a rope on that milk crate. They put the rockfish in there, put the milk crate on top of the rockfish, tie a rope to it, and they send it down as fast as they can. Now, I know that sounds like, you know, elevator to whoo, whoo, back and down, but even in the aquarium world, I told you guys, I've caught rockfish and I've seen that happen. And we bring them back to the zoo. We basically put them in a large trash can with a lid on it. And we put like a pipe in there that they can go inside. And they go right inside that pipe. We put the trash can about 20 feet in our deepest aquarium. And after about two, three days, they're fine. So we think that that's a method to help kind of control some of this bear trauma. So, it's a good, so now you see people with milk cartons on their boats. And it's a good way to go. What you don't want to do, by the way, is something called fizzing. Fizzing is when you see the fish and the eyes are popping out and this thing's coming out of its mouth. A lot of people think that that thing coming out of the mouth is that swim bladder, that balloon full of air. That's not what it is. Spine, swim bladder, stomach. It expands the swim bladder. The first thing that happens is the stomach comes out of your mouth. If your stomach came out of your mouth and people are starting to pop holes in that, it is going to deflate. But, you know, good luck. <laughs> it's, it's just going to be a big hole in your stomach. So the best thing is rapid resubmergence is the best way to go. And the rebar is just for weight. 
Yes, absolutely. It doesn't have to be rebar, but it's nice. It's convenient. Someone always finds some somewhere. Any way you can get it to get it back down there. And also some people will use hooks that have no barbs on it and have a, a really rounded hook. Uh, Pete, what do you call that hook? Circle hook. Great, I love that. And so they'll hook the rockfish, which is, it's already been caught, I'm not saying it's great, and they'll just drop it down on their downrigger, right down to the bottom that you can usually just pop off. So there's a couple ways right there. Any other questions? Thanks. All right, thank you very much, everyone.